Hello, I'm Michael Serapio, and welcome to Profile. In 2018, Karina Gould made Canadian history by becoming the first federal cabinet minister to give birth while sitting in the Executive Council. At the time, maternity leave was not available to members of Parliament, so, partly guided by the rules, partly guided by her own sense of duty, Ms. Gould took less than 10 weeks off. Well, today, Karina Gould is preparing to welcome her second child, and in the year since 2018, much has changed. So Gould, who is now the government house leader, is planning to do things differently. That includes taking more time away from Ottawa to be with her newborn child, and perhaps equally as important, setting a precedent for other women who want a life in politics. Minister, thank you for taking the time. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm wondering how you're feeling right now. Not only are you getting close to your due date, you're also getting close to your maternity leave, six months away from the Hill. Uh, does that weigh heavily on you now that that day is coming? <laughs> yeah, it does. Uh, well, I'm very excited because I can't wait to uh, welcome this new baby to the world. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm also, you know, nervous about taking at time away from Ottawa. I mean, I'm gonna be taking a step back from my ministerial responsibilities, but because we have um, hybrid parliament now, uh, I'm able to continue to vote and do all of my MP things, um, you know, from home. So so it's gonna be uh, like a unique experience, um, but, but yeah, it, it will be strange to uh, be away from the house for that long. Now, now you became government house leader not that long ago. Mm -hmm. You were sworn in back in July you were already expecting. I'm kind of wondering about that conversation that you had with the Prime Minister. Were you nervous to tell him? Nervous that he might change his mind? Well, I mean, I told him before uh, the cabinet shuffle, so I, um, I did think it was important to, to let him know so that he could make, you know, an informed decision about it. Uh, his response to me was kind of like, why would that change um, what job I want to give you, right? Um, so, um, no, I wasn't, I wasn't nervous to tell him. I, I was nervous to tell him the first time uh, because it had never been done before. But again, his response to me the first time that I told him I was pregnant was, Karina, that's wonderful. We're going to make this work and we're going to make sure you're successful. So I've always felt really supported uh, by the Prime Minister, by his team uh, to kind of forge this new path um, and to, to be able to do it. So uh, talking about this new path, essentially you will be away for six months, away from, from your government house leader duties. Uh, Steve McKinnon, the, yeah. the chief government whip, will, st will stand in. How did that plan come about? With my first son, um, I was only away from Ottawa for about nine weeks in total, um, and only I think five of those were sitting weeks. So I, I came back um, you know, with a three-month-old baby um, you know, to, to finish the session. and. And I did it, but it was it was really hard, and it was hard on me in terms of you know how I was doing postpartum. I had just lost my mom. Um, I you know had asked my husband to come to Ottawa with me so that we could make it work, um, and it was hard on my family. So I you know decided that if we were and my husband and I actually decided if we were going to do this again, we needed to do it differently. Um, and the fact that we have hybrid parliament allows us to do it differently. Uh, and I think in a healthier, more sustainable way for me personally, but also for my family, which is really important. And so when I told the prime minister that I was expecting again, I made it very clear that I needed to do it differently than I did last time, that I needed to take more time. Um, and he was very, he was very open and supportive. Um, so they were just kind of trying to figure out, I think, how to do this because last time uh, Scott Bryson, who was the president of the Treasury Board, was just acting as Minister of Democratic Institutions for that period of time. But as I said, it was only like five sitting weeks that I wasn't here, right? So, um, you know, it wasn't the same kind of amount of time. So they needed to find somebody to do like an actual mat leave cover. And so this is kind of an innovative uh, thing that they're trying out uh, to do this for a cabinet minister. Mm -hmm. So the prime minister, as you said, was supportive. Yeah. Uh, what about your, your other cabinet colleagues, other members of parliament who, who may have even wanted to have the job as government house leader? What was the reaction <laughs> from amongst them? I mean, everybody's been supportive. Um, I don't know how many people want the job of government house leader, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but uh, now that I'm doing it, I'm, I'm enjoying it. But I can't say it was something that I coveted <laughs> before. Um, so I'm not sure there's a huge 
huge amount of competition for it. Everybody has been super supportive. I mean, both the first time that I had um, my, my first baby and now with the second one. Uh, listen, let's go back a little bit because you, you did reference um, the, your first mat leave with Oliver and, and nine weeks, as you say. Yeah. Dig into that a bit more for us, if you will. Uh, talk to us about your thinking back then versus your thinking this time around with a second pregnancy. Well, the first time it was the first time it had ever happened uh, in Canada at the federal level, and I was the first one to do it. So I didn't really feel like I had permission to take more time. Um, and, and that didn't really come from anyone other than, than me. Um, but I didn't have an experience to draw on from somebody else who had done it. So um, if you go back, you know, the last and only other liberal member of parliament who had done this was Sheila Copps. And certainly, you know, she came back almost immediately. And that was a, you know, that was an even more different time than where we are now. But that was kind of the only example that I had. Um, and so even though there had been other provincial ministers who had given birth, like they also didn't really have the permission to take more time. So I felt a lot of pressure to come back quickly to demonstrate to my constituents and to Parliament that, you know, this wasn't going to stop me as a parliamentarian. And it didn't, but it was, it was really, really hard. Um, and I was nursing and it was a big juggling act. And so my husband and I, you know, we, we weren't ready to do <laughs> that again. Um, and so we you know, had talked about, you know, do we want to have another child? But if we did, we would have to do it differently. And I think I also learned through that experience that I probably didn't have to be as hard on myself as I was. And um, if I actually want more young women to get into politics, have children if they want to, and stay in politics, I need to, I need to be the person that provides the example and gives them the permission to take the time that they need. We also in 2018 didn't have a um, uh, parental leave for members of parliament and so I worked with then government house leader Bardis Chagger and um, the conservative house leader Candace Bergen actually to bring that about and so June of 2019 it happened very uneventfully in the House of Commons, but I was there when they moved the unanimous consent motion to bring in maternity leave and parental leave for members of parliament, because before that we didn't actually have any um, permission to be away. So you could be away for sick leave, but you know, giving birth and being pregnant isn't, you're not sick, and so it's not considered to, to be for medical reasons, and I don't think it should be either. I think it should be its own specific thing that gives people the permission to be a politician and to be a parent as well. Mm -hmm. Did you think you would have to make a choice though? Because as you said, you're elected, then you, you get appointed to cabinet. Mm -hmm. At that point, did you think, oh wait, maybe I have to choose between motherhood and my career? Yeah, I mean, I think at that point, it was kind of like, oh, how is this, how is this going to work, right? Um, how are we going to do it? But I have an incredibly supportive husband. I have an incredibly supportive boss and team and colleagues who um, have helped make it work. I just didn't want to make the choice, <laughs> right? Like I just, I just felt like, no, I, I, why should I have to make that choice? You know, after we were elected in 2015, uh, we were at a caucus retreat uh, that summer in uh, in Quebec, and the prime minister was commenting on how we've had a bit of a baby boom, right, in the caucus but they were all my male colleagues, right? <laughs> like, which is good and I'm very happy for them uh, that they all had babies after the election and that's great. But like women shouldn't have to make that choice. So let's, let's modernize the institution in a way that allows for all Canadians to you know, be parents as well as politicians. And um, it is kind of shocking for me that in like 2018, it was the first time that there was a female cabinet minister who had a baby in office, but then again, there weren't that many young women appointed to those kinds of positions, and it wasn't really acceptable for women to to do or, or be both. And I just I just didn't want to accept that I had to make that choice. Mm -hmm. So, as you said, not a lot of examples that came before you, at least when it comes to the Canadian context. Was there an inspiration for you, though? Because you know, I. 
I, I think about when when my husband and I became parents. So yeah. I was thinking, okay, how is this going to look like? Where, where have we seen this before? How do we balance that? Was there anyone outside of the federal realm that you looked to as perhaps an example that you might be able to follow? Well, um, Laurel Broughton in Ontario, uh, she was a cabinet minister, she had twins, so I'd been in touch with her to kind of ask her how she had done it. Um, and then Sheila Copps, right, um, in terms of at the federal level. There'd been other members of parliament who, um, I think there were two NDP MPs who, maybe a couple more, uh, Nikki Ashton had um, her twins just before I did. Um, but it's, it's different when you're a member of parliament versus being a member of parliament and a cabinet minister. It's just a, it's just a different experience. Um, but uh, I'd say I leaned very heavily on Sheila Copps uh, particularly afterwards, <laughs> to kind of say, like, how did you do this and how am I supposed to do this? Any particular scenarios that you needed help with? Well, it's just, I mean, when you're a new parent in general, it's just managing it. And, you know, there's a lot of demands on your time as a member of parliament and as a cabinet minister. And so it's it's managing that. Um, you know, I, I certainly look to my mom, um, who, you know, was an entrepreneur, had four kids, uh, was kind of a renaissance woman and, and seemed to be able to do it all but as I said she um, she passed away when I was seven months pregnant with my with my first son so I had kind of um, expected that I would lean on her a lot <laughs> and get a lot of advice from her as to how to make things work but unfortunately I didn't I didn't have that so and you know when you're doing things for the first time you're you're figuring it out and trying to make those decisions so um, yeah, it was it was it was challenging to navigate, but uh, you know, until my son was a year old, I mean, I kind of tucked him under my wing, and he came most places with me. And then, you know, I have to give credit to my amazing husband, who, you know, really stepped up and and made sure that I could do my job on behalf of Canadians, but also. Um, you know, be there for my son as well. So. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is you say all this, um, and, and you were dealing with a lot, not only your first child, uh, the loss of your mother, being a parliamentarian, being a cabinet minister, so much on your plate, and yet when, when I look at the interviews from back then, you seem very certain that nine or ten weeks was going to be enough. You know, I had never had a baby before, so how would I know? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Right? Like, was, that, was that just it, or was that you were unwilling to kind of uh, accept that this was going to be a big change in your life? Yeah, I mean, I think most people, before they have kids, can't really understand how much it's going to impact your life and how much your life is going to change. But I, I recognized, I didn't recognize it in the moment, but with hindsight, I can see that it wasn't enough time for me and my own mental health. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of made the choice that I, I was going to focus on two things, right? Being a mom and taking care of my son and my job and everything else fell by the wayside um, because I didn't have the space or the energy uh, to do that. And so I don't think, um, you know, my son suffered as a result and my job didn't suffer as a result. Um, but a whole bunch of other things did, right? Um, so, you know, with the benefit of having done it once, <laughs> I kind of know um, what I think is, is a better path this time around. Um, and certainly, you know, like I'm, I'm a go-getter, I'm a hard worker. You know, I was like, oh yeah, you know, eight, nine, ten weeks, no problem, I'll be back at it, it'll be fine, the baby will be with me. Um, but, you know, like, and, and it was, like, it was fine. It's just, it could have been better. Mm -hmm. so. so how will this time around be different? What's your actual game plan as to how you'll have your mat leave and carry out duties from time to time? So I, I'll be here uh, for the next three weeks until the session ends in December. Um, and then I'm officially going on mat leave as of January 15th, unless I give birth a bit earlier and then I'll know <laughs> that'll be the official start date um, and I'll be on leave until uh, Parliament rises in June so I'm gonna take a step back from my ministerial responsibilities but I'll still be voting um, in all the votes I'll still participate in caucus meetings virtually um, and you know I'll probably take at least four to six weeks where I'm you know tools down um, but then I'll start doing constituency work again and going out to community events and um, yeah, I'll just, I'll see how I'm, how I'm feeling, right? Uh, but, you know, I, 
last time, I think I took four weeks where I didn't do, you know, like kind of any, well, I say any work, but there was still like, it was, it was year end at the time. So I had to do all the administrative stuff. I still do constituency calls. Yeah, that's work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I gave birth and was on my Blackberry, you know, like it was so funny. Like my, my son was sleeping in the like bassinet beside me in the hospital. My husband was sleeping beside me and yeah. I was like on my Blackberry wrapping things up. But, but, um, but yeah, I, that I'll probably do something similar, but it'll be like working part-time as opposed to full-time for those six months. But I'll be home, which will be um, different than traveling back and forth uh, to Ottawa. Mm -hmm. so. uh, do you think, and I don't know how much of a type A person you are, but do you think that any portion of that personality will, will be challenging during this mat leaf? My husband's worried about it. <laughs> <laughs> Was he yeah. said to you? <laughs> yeah, no, I think he, he recognizes that, you know, we need to take the time. This is important for our family, but I think he's a little nervous about um, me being home and not being like full on working um, the whole time. But I think this will be a, a good balance. I know I'll watch question period every day and I'll probably be, you know, texting colleagues uh, when they do a good job or when I think they can say something differently. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try to like, you know, take a take a step back. But I think that'll be hard. Let's talk a bit more about um, how welcoming Parliament is for, for new parents, new mothers. And, you know, I want to say new parent, but of course in this society it still falls on women more than it does on men. Um, because it, it was Nikki Ashton, and I'm paraphrasing here, she said to be a new mother on the Hill is to prove that the patriarchy is alive and well. Uh, what do you say to that? I mean, I have to say it was very strange pushing a stroller around Parliament Hill like by myself. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it's obviously not a, a, like a family friendly place, right? It, it's, it's a workplace, but um, I'd say things have changed a lot. Um, you know, after the 2021 election, I was sitting in the chamber when we were electing the speaker and um, I felt really differently because I looked across the way and there was Laurel Collins from the NDP who had her baby. There was um, Layla Goodrich from the Conservatives who had her baby. I believe Rosemary Falk from the Conservatives was pregnant. And I think there was a Block MP who was pregnant as well. And I just thought like, look how much things have changed in six years, right? Like, you know, it's, it's really remarkable. It doesn't mean everything is perfect and easy. It's really hard to be a parliamentarian and a parent, uh, especially a, a mother of a newborn. Um, but I think things have changed and are changing. And um, to see that diversity and the fact that we now have um, virtual voting makes such a difference because that was, that was one of the big questions, right? Like how, how are we going to allow MPs to take maternity or parental leave? How are they going to vote? And now it's funny because we never asked that question about MPs that were on sick leave, right? You're on sick leave, we don't expect you to vote, but oh, if you're on maternity leave, like how are you going to, to do that? So, I mean, there, there are those double standards for sure. And there were interesting examples that were being piloted around the world, the UK, for one, um, and this was something I was talking about, is you know when they had their MPs go on maternity leave, they would essentially um, do one of two things. They could either give their vote to the whip, and the whip would vote on their behalf, or um, they would just pair with an opposition member of parliament and say, okay, like I'm not voting for this period of time, someone in the opposition won't vote as well. Um, and so there were other parliaments around the world that were experimenting and trying and, and Canada just, like we just weren't there. But now that we have this hybrid option, it means that all of those MPs who came with babies or have had babies since then have been able to better manage their time that they need to be at home with their baby, but also representing their constituents and participating in parliament. Um, you know, when I was in my last role as Minister of Families, Rosemary Falk was on the HUMA committee mm -hmm. and, you know, she had just had a baby and so, she, but she was participating virtually, right? So she was still doing her job as an MP, but she could do it from home and participate in everything she needed to participate in, represent her constituents, uh, do her parliamentary work 
but do it in a way that made it possible for her also to be a mom. And so like, I hear what Nikki's saying. I don't disagree with her in 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, but today in 2023, and the fact that we've now made this permanent means that, you know, it, it, just, it just makes it possible for, I think, women not only to become parliamentarians and have a family, but to stay as parliamentarians. So I, I think that's really exciting. And this is more than I could have even imagined in 2018 yeah. because the, the world has changed so much. And, you know, I mean, COVID was terrible, but this is one of the good things that I think has come out of that experience. Um, <laughs> across the hall here is the family room um there's a traffic jam right because parliament wasn't designed for for families to be here even but though this is a renovated building even though well and and so actually that came about because um we didn't have a space in center block and so between nikki ashton christine moore myself uh, we had conversations with then speaker Jeff O'Regan to make sure that before we moved to West Block there was um, a family room here. Now it's a very small space um, and it wasn't really designed with what you actually need in mind. It was kind of like well this is what we think. Um, so now as we're moving to center block um, and part of my responsibility as government house leader is to work on the Board of Eternal Economy to approve the plans there, is to make sure that there's like a proper family room where maybe more than one MP can go at a time because what we're seeing is more than one MP having a baby at a time, right? Which is wonderful. Um, the other thing that I think uh, we should have on Parliament Hill um, and that I've been advocating for, not successfully yet, is uh, like a child minding space, right? So. People come here, parliamentarians come here, and sometimes they have to bring their kids of, of varying ages, right? And they don't necessarily need someone to watch their child for eight hours, but if they could drop them off for, you know, an hour or two while they're at committee or while they have to vote, that would be really, really helpful for them. Like, think about, like, you go to the gym, right? And there's a child minding space for that hour, hour and a half that you're there. That would be something that I think would be hugely beneficial um, as well, because again, Sometimes you have to bring your seven-year-old with you or your 10-year-old and you don't necessarily want them to be alone in, in your office or like sitting yeah. at committee proceedings. So, um, so that's something I, I, haven't, I haven't been successful in getting that there yet, but um, that I think would, would be a, a big game changer and particularly for people, parliamentarians whose, whose children are a bit older. Because there is childcare on the Hill, but it's not... Um, it's not super useful for parliamentarians um, the way that it's designed. It's great for staff who work on Parliament Hill, but not really for, for parliamentarians. What's also interesting is here you are, um, now government house leader, but before this, uh, trusted by the prime minister to negotiate those childcare agreements right across the country. I want to ask two things on that. One, how you felt about that contribution that you made. I'm assuming that's something that you're very proud of. Yeah, I, that's my proudest achievement as a parliamentarian and as a cabinet minister. I, at one of the very first events I hosted as a candidate in Burlington was on affordable child care. So I invited Kirsty Duncan, uh, the MP from Etobicoke Centre, to come meet with a group of new moms who were on maternity leave who were really struggling because they either couldn't find a place for their child for when they returned to work or they were actually saying, I can't afford to go back to work because childcare is so expensive. It's either the same or maybe sometimes more than what my monthly take home is after taxes. And so for me, one of the reasons why I got into politics was to push for more affordable childcare. And when the prime minister asked me to take on the role of the minister of, of families and children and social development and to conclude those childcare agreements with uh, the more intransient provinces, <laughs> Um, I, I, I couldn't have been happier or more excited um, and to see that come into fruition and to talk to families right across the country who have benefited from those reduced child care fees um, who are starting to benefit from increased access to child care spaces like I don't know what else I could do to like top off my life <laughs> right like that is that is an absolute highlight for me and uh, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's so meaningful, it's so impactful, 
Um, and it's like that is a dream come true. And I stand on the shoulders of giants because there have been childcare advocates who have been trying to get this in Canada for over 50 years, right? And their persistence, their commitment, they're not letting up. Um, has gotten us to where we are today and uh, got a lot more work to do and it's not my portfolio anymore but uh, it's I think it's really really exciting. But I do want to get back to your own impact then because uh, as you stated earlier what you're doing will set a precedent for future generations so to to young girls young women out there that want to take on a leadership role who want to life in politics but feel that in order to do it they'll have to sacrifice motherhood what do you say? You don't have to. You absolutely don't have to, right? Um, it's it's hard, and you get pulled in, in different directions. But um, it's funny. I was at an event yesterday in Burlington, and um, we were talking about you know what my maternity leave is going to look like. And I said, oh, I'm going to be out of commission for a little while in January. And uh, uh, an older woman said, you're not out of commission. You're forging the path for the future because it's giving people permission, giving women permission uh, to do both. And in a uh, environment and a workplace that traditionally has not been welcoming for women and has particularly not been welcoming for mothers or, or women with children, uh, I think this is really, really important because if, if what they wanna do is pursue an ambitious career to serve their country, and they want to have a family, that shouldn't be one or the other. It should just be. Because we haven't asked men to make that choice ever. Right? And I think for me too, taking more time this time around says to the next woman, you have permission to do that too. Right? You don't have to come back right away. You don't have to sacrifice your mental health, your well being, your family, your career. Um, you can do it in the way that you need to do it and we're going to work to create the supports and the workplace and the system that's going to enable you to be successful. My conversation with Government House Leader Karina Gould. I'm Michael Serapio. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you on the next Profile right here on CPAC.